Hello everyone, this is Richard from Modern Health Span. Today we'll have a look at a paper from Dr. Steve Horvath and others that examines which of the hallmarks of aging impact epigenetic age. I think this is both interesting and important. The epigenetic clocks are being used as a measure of aging in vivo experiments. How are they related to real aging phenotypes and the hallmarks that underlie them? This is the question that this paper is trying to answer. First, a disclaimer that in this video, we are sharing a study that we found interesting. It is not a recommendation or medical advice. Here is the paper, the relationship between epigenetic age and the hallmarks of aging in human cells. Dr. Steve Horvath is one of the authors. Epigenetic clocks are based on the levels of methylation at certain CPG sites and are used to measure age giving epigenetic acceleration as the difference between your epigenetic and chronological age. Acceleration of epigenetic clocks is correlated with a wide variety of pathologies, health states, lifestyles, mental states, and environmental factors, which would imply that they do represent real biological processes involved in aging. However, we don't understand the mechanism that drives these clocks. In this study, they looked at how epigenetic age is related to the classic hallmarks of aging. The clock they used was the skin and blood clock defined by Dr. Horvath in 2018. They saw that it does not seem affected by cellular senescence, telomere attrition, or genomic instability, but it is associated with nutrient sensing, mitochondrial activity, and stem cell composition. Let's quickly review the hallmarks of aging, first documented in a paper in 2013 shown in this diagram. They are genomic instability, telomere attrition, epigenetic alterations, loss of proteostasis, deregulated nutrient sensing, mitochondrial dysfunction, cellular senescence, stem cell exhaustion, and altered intracellular communication. To be a hallmark of aging, the phenomena should fulfill three criteria. First, it should be manifested in normal aging. Promoting it should accelerate aging and ameliorating it should slow aging. So the question the authors are seeking to answer is, does the ages shown by the epigenetic clock track changes made in these hallmarks? The first test they did was to see the impact of cellular senescence on the epigenetic age of cells in culture. The cells were donated from just born healthy children, so had an age of zero. They first tried various ways to cause senescence using replicative senescence in red, X-ray irradiation in green, and RAS gene in yellow. The RAS gene appears to be an oncogene, which when expressed pushes the cell towards senescence. They saw that the age of the irradiated cells and those forced into senescence by RAS was not significantly different from the controls. The ones where replication, so telomere shortening, causes senescence were older, but that may be because it took six months to reach that point. To test this, they tried cells with HTERT gene expressed in them. This gene allows the telomere to extend and so for the cell to avoid replicated senescence. What they saw was that there was no significant difference between the ages of the two cell types, showing that the aging was due to the cells aging naturally and that telomere length does not impact the epigenetic clock. The next test was for genomic instability. Does increased double strand breaks accelerate the clock? They started by irradiating the cells. They used a number of different doses and timings for the irradiation. This graph shows 20 grays, a unit of radiation, which was used on the cells for 30 days. It did not cause significant aging. Another test used one microgray over a period of time. The growth on the left was mildly impeded, but the age on the right was not affected. In this graph, CPD stands for cumulative population doubling. So this shows that the increased genomic instability did not accelerate the epigenetic clock. They then looked at nutrient sensing using mTOR as the target. Even after the cells were quite old, when they had rapamycin placed on them, it significantly reduced the epigenetic age. Another of the hallmarks is mitochondrial dysfunction. First, they used CCCP, an inhibitor of mitochondrial activity. This did accelerate the epigenetic age. To try in the opposite direction, they used beza fibrate, which increases mitochondrial biogenesis, which we can see 
reduce the epigenetic age and stem cells. They enriched the cultures with neonatal stem cells and saw that the age became less. Adding more stem cells to the culture and looking at the ages of the cells separately, we see that the stem cells remain young, while the stem cell depleted cultures are older. They propose that this may be because the age of the culture is the result of the mixed age of the cells, some of which are young and some of which are old. Another question that they looked at was, when does the epigenetic clock start ticking? And it seems to be from when the cells start to differentiate. On the left-hand graph, the embryonic stem cells, or ESCs, did not age, but once they had differentiated, they started to age as normal. This was also accompanied by a genome-wide reduction in the epigenetic methylation seen on the right-hand graph. They also looked at some substances which have been shown to extend the lifespan of cell cultures, NAD, NR, and metformin. However, these did not have any significant effect on the aging clock though they did extend the life beyond the controls. Here is the summary of the results. Cellular senescence, telomere attrition, and genomic instability did not impact epigenetic aging. Deregulated nutrient sensing, mitochondrial dysfunction, stem cell exhaustion did. Altered cell communication also appears to do this. For this result, they refer to the work of Dr. Katcher. In summary, they consider the structured nature of epigenetic aging with that of aging caused by random damage. They see that both processes exist in parallel and together lead to the phenotypes of aging. And so a longevity therapy will need to address both arms of aging, both slowing the epigenetic age and addressing phenomena such as senescent cells. They also highlight another point, that although it's intuitive to see a specific tissue as having a uniform age, this may not be so, and it is the mix of cells with different ages that make up the overall age. And changing age could be the result of changing relative numbers of the cells. I think this is super interesting, though it is just a start. Some of the things that I took away from this, although it makes sense, I had not thought about it before, that embryonic stem cells don't age. I was also surprised that senescence, telomere length, and genomic instability don't impact epigenetic age. What does this imply for Dr. Sinclair's view of aging being caused by epigenetic dysfunction because of excess damage to the genome? But I think that the biggest thing was the idea of two key processes in aging, the fixed process of epigenetic aging and a random set of damages which act in parallel to reduce the phenotypes of aging. So both programmed and accumulated damage at the same time. <music>